So everyone, um, for those of you who do not know Dr. Karen Becker, she is uh, one of the most remarkable veterinarians who has been working in the veterinary field for a few years, but not as many as I did. However, she's achieved to be one of the highest regarded veterinarian and also has been the most followed veterinarian in the world. Karen, if I remember well, you've studied veterinary medicine in the 90s and then you opened veterinary clinics uh, in Chicago and then you went on to writing several books and we'll talk about them as well and have been providing those who are helpless, the animals, the care, but also educating the people who have been looking after these animals who cannot make a decision. So I, I would like to welcome you here and thank you so much for making the time. And thank we have you. a lot of things to go through. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I like coming back to you because uh, you remind me of the times when we were studying holistic medicine in the 90s with Dr. Richard Pitcairn in the courses, and that's where we met. But also it was the good time where I feel that we are hopeful that within the next 10, 20 years, medicine would be transformed and that we would not be dealing with the situations that we're dealing now and with the polarity of medicine. Mm. And the first question I'd like to ask you is, was your childhood in any way special or different from the other children that made you become a veterinarian? Mm. And how, how did you grow up? Because there's always a story behind, behind why mm. we do what we do. There, there is always a story behind why we do what we do and who we are. Our, our past circumstances and experiences shape and not just form our opinions, but actually I believe form our vantage point in life. And I am incredibly indebted to my beautiful parents for recognizing very early in my life that I was very much drawn to the natural world, outdoors specifically, a lot of obsessions with bugs and frogs and lizards and worms and snakes, a lot, butterflies, anything, but especially small things, a lot of creepy crawlies, just obsessed and um, and, and had an, a compulsion to care for them. And I'm so thankful, Peter, that I had parents that fostered that because out of my desire to, to take care of things that clearly didn't have an owner and didn't have a guardian and no one was looking out for these things, it doesn't, you don't spend too much time in nature before you find something injured. And when you find something injured, this overwhelming feeling of what am I going to do because there isn't an owner or a guardian and there's not a veterinarian that's probably going to take care of a, a, a one winged butterfly. But those early experiences of what do you do when you find something that's injured that needs help, but there's no place to take it, that, that set me on my career path very early. And I became a wildlife rehabilitator a state licensed rehabilitator in Iowa when I was 14 and a federally licensed wildlife rehabilitator when I was 16 and a, an overwhelming desire to become the best wildlife rehabilitator that I could because I knew that these animals, these injured, orphaned, sick, um, debilitated wild animals had no one caring for them. And that was my, uh, that still is my hobby, my passion, my desire before, before I became a veterinarian, I went to the largest college of natural resources in the U.S. to study wildlife management. And I thought I would just be a wildlife biologist and just fix wild animals. But I realized, of course, when you fix wild animals that you have to be a veterinarian in order, in order to fix them. So becoming a veterinarian was a logical step. But my, my upbringing in caring for wild animals absolutely set the stage for my desire to have the knowledge to be able to adequately and holistically fix things for sure. Yeah. Tell me about, I know that you love wildlife and I think that there is a, that's one thing that we have in common because really the animals are at our mercy these days on this planet. Um, 
but I do not know many people who started with the wildlife on the road and with earthworms and rescuing earthworms. <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> well, I, I, it's interesting. My obsession with dirt and soil started very young as well. I really am into, I, little did I know that there was this entire microbiome that I would fall in love with, with soil and dirt and the earth. But fishing around in the earth, you find a lot of unbelievable treasures like worms. And of course, when it rains, worms come up and that was my first rescue project, Peter, was rescuing worms. And I would bring them in when they were drowning, and I would put them back out when the sun came out. And this ecology, the cycle of life early on, my parents were amazing at helping foster an understanding of that, but also my place within that cycle. And that as humans, we are stewards to care for the earth and its inhabitants, but we we need to take that responsibility very seriously and walk incredibly lightly, recognizing our role is, is holds the weight of the pendulum between excellent choices and sheer devastation on the earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you think you've come like that? You've been born like that? Or do you think that some sort of circumstance have made you that way? It's like so interesting that you say, it's so interesting that you say that. I did genetic testing three, two and a half years ago now, I did genetic testing on myself and because I've had some strange, some strange physiologic things express themselves. And I was like, I wonder if I had a genetic predisposition to like, I had breast cancer early on in my life. And th that's what I discovered. I was BRCA positive. I had the gene for breast cancer. My grandma died of breast cancer and all my aunts has, have, have had a round of lumps and bumps, but I knew I was taking very good care of myself, and yet I ended up with this terrible diagnosis at when I was young in my twenties. That set me. That also profoundly impacted. I think early disease in life impacts you one way or another. You either become a victim or you become super empowered. And for me, it was like, my goodness, my DNA holds a lot of information that I would like to know more about. So I started doing DNA testing when I found that I was BRCA positive. But I continued doing additional DNA testing, and three years ago, I discovered I and double homozygous dominant for empathy. And so when you say, is there a genetic involvement? I did discover there is. And when I was talking to my genetic counselor who was talking about, I discovered all sorts of things like uh, I'm MTHFR, which you don't absorb vitamin B12. That's really good to know because I'm also a vegetarian. So finding sources of B12 that resonate with my body was a really important thing. But the first thing the genetic counselor said to me, she has no idea who I am. She said, I'm not going to cry. She, but she said to me, you have to feel the weight of the world because your DNA dictates that you feel the pain of others profoundly around you. And I do feel the pain of others profoundly around me, primarily within the animal kingdom. Yeah. So there is a genetic thing that still does this to me every time I think about how important it is that we rise up to protect those that don't have protection. I am reminded of my DNA that pushes me to think and act in that way. And I think that empathy is something that even if you don't have the DNA for empathy, I think empathy can be fostered at a young age with children, with, uh, with parents that are able to do that. So I had this double blessing of having the genetics for empathy and parents that fostered it. And I think that that has allowed me to cultivate the skills that I have. My biggest challenge, Peter, I know you feel the same way. We've talked about this before. When we have patients we can't fix, those are my biggest nights of insomnia. Our patients that we can't fix drive us to become better doctors. And we don't always win the, the battle and we don't always, our patients don't always survive, but our primary central focus goal is if we don't know what's going on, if we can't fix them, we're going to go on a hunt. We're going to go on a search to find out what we can do to best extend their lives and to best improve their well-being, and to do everything we can to provide as much time and quality to be able to give our patients the very best chance they have at a fulfilled, vibrant life. 
And that makes us better doctors because we're never satisfied with telling anyone there's nothing more we can do. We always want to be able to offer our clients and patients more. And I think that that pushes us to be, to offer services and ideas and roadmaps and healing modalities that potentially other doctors don't have in their toolbox because we've cultivated those tools out of necessity. Out of the despair that um, the conventional methods do not work. So you just search. Uh, it's beautiful. I really love the story about the genetic testing. And, and um, I, I do believe that, that, you know, I see it in little kids, like little kids uh, are very either empaths or they're self-centered and so on. But as in, as anything in life, I think that we definitely can train and, and, and be that way and be aware. And I think that the best way, and you do it so beautifully, is to try to put ourselves in other animals or people's shoes and, and try to cross that bridge from the self to the other. And that's really beautiful. So what is your suggestion for those of you who carry the the, the burden of the world on their shoulders and also the, you know, the destruction that, that, that we see around and so on. You know, so many people actually are almost paralyzed or disabled by, by the weight of, of this. Like, how do you deal with that yourself? And what would you recommend um, to our listeners and, and those who are watching? That's a, it's a big question and it's a difficult question, but I believe that two things have to happen for us to continue down our evolutionary path of being the best version of ourselves that we can manifest prior to transitioning. Part of that, I think, involves developing a patience and a tolerance for people that have very different views from us. And I have found that even in the, in the holistic community, Peter, I believe that sometimes each veterinarian, for instance, each feeding style is where I see it most. Each feeding style has very intense feelings with a lot of people who feel a certain way about certain issues or topics, veggie, no veggie, steamed veggie, ground veggie, pureed, raw, you know, all of these issues. Those are all different groups on Facebook that fight with each other. And from my vantage point, we, if we can start looking at the similarities, similarities that we have with one another, if we can start celebrating the fact that whether we decide to steam veggies or feed them raw, puree them, whether we just, regardless of what our feelings are towards one topic, let's say food, we can come together in recognizing and celebrating our similarities. For instance, we all believe in fresh food and we believe that fresh food is a better choice than ultra processed food. If we can start looking at what we have in common, Peter, I think that all of us have a whole lot more in common than we do differences. So first of all, gaining a tolerance and a threshold for celebrating our similarities, but also recognizing that our differences are actually a place for community members to plug in. So in celebrating our differences, instead of being frustrated that there's 47 different fresh feeding styles, or 47 different ways to approach a, a, a condition or a state of well-being, we can celebrate the fact that there are so many veterinarians and so many people providing different vantage points that if people hearing what we have to say doesn't quite fit, that there are other community members within our own corner that can support them and love them. Our goal needs to be come in lovely people. Do you resonate with what I'm saying? Yes. Great. Please join, join my circle, join us, join the conversation. And if not join this conversation in this conversation, because there's all of these amazing conversations going on and we're all working together to improve the well-being of animals. Find a place that you resonate with and plug in, but don't, don't bash the system next to you and don't get frustrated that someone else is doing it differently and don't get frustrated that you believe you're right and they're wrong. Recognize that this is what I believe at this point in time and hopefully in five and ten years I will evolve to continue enlightening my perspective and opening my vantage point to be able to have different ideas. That's how we all get through life. It's when we start pointing at one another that we tear each other down, we put up walls, and we end up with tunnel vision, not only separated, not bringing our community together and not supporting one another, but being in a lonely place 
that doesn't offer much growth because you've cut off all of your friends, colleagues, and potential support systems with people that you didn't even know that you wanted to be best friends with because you, did, you didn't give them a chance to get to know them because they had different viewpoints from you. So I think the tolerance piece is massive. It's beautiful. I, you know, I, uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking this is, this is so, th this applies to every aspect of life and especially now because, you know, the division in people and so on um, is um, growing in different areas, but I'm going to stay with art and with art of medicine yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, with, with, with music or yes. with, with, uh, with uh, painters or with actors, like we, Imagine if everyone was the same, I know. if every actor acted the same way, if every song was the same genre and the same tone and every voice was the same, it would be really boring and horrible. Actually, we would probably die of boredom and and the world would not evolve. But I, I love that you're kind of proposing or suggesting the, the communication and conversation and, you know, debating our points. I have some family members who would say, you know, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. I, and, and then I know that at the end, those who do not learn and do not have their mind yes. open actually suffer the most. Yes. And, and that's what you were saying. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's interesting yeah. because when it comes to, let's say, religions, it's beautiful when Muslim kids can play with atheist kids and Jewish kids and Christian kids and that hinges. We can all have our kids together and they can learn and grow from the differences. We can celebrate those differences. And if someone, you know, is looking for faith and they, you know, they try this and try this and try this, our goal is to wish them well so that they can find something that resonates with where they're at so that they can feel better in their body as they go through life. That's what we want for everything we love. And yet, even if we believe in our hearts, I'm right and you're wrong, we still are able to be kind to one another in those situations. We don't have to have similar viewpoints on religion and politics and social issues. We can love each other where we're at and we can be kind and we can be respectful. And we don't have to tear each other down. We don't have to say she is right or he is wrong. We can say they have a different viewpoint. And the reason I have a different viewpoint is this, this, and this. We get to celebrate and talk about why we believe what we believe without necessarily tearing anyone else down. And that to me is a really good place that we all need to strive to be, that we can come together with our differences and our entire wellness community can be stronger by instead of tearing down our differences, celebrating them. But the second point, Peter, besides embracing diversity and getting a whole lot of patience, I'm going to propose that out of my double empath DNA, a system of proactive medicine is on the horizon that we all need to embrace and accept and really strive to make the paradigm shift in the next 10 years. And here's why. Do I think that veterinarians, generally speaking, are amazing people that love animals and would do whatever they can to help? Yes, of course. But do I think that we graduate, you and I graduated, not having the tools and resources we need to be able to effectively treat lifestyle disease? Yes. When we graduated, I was okay in triage. So animals hit by car. Like if you have a medical emergency, I learned what to do. And if I, if an animal had infectious disease, I learned what to do. The problem is 90% of what we see in the exam room is not contagious disease or hit by car. It's lifestyle diseases. It's diseases created because we didn't learn in veterinary school how to prevent degeneration from occur from occurring. And that to me is the point of pain for every veterinarian. There's a reason why veterinary suicide is off the charts. And I believe that our profession is not training and equipping doctors with the proactive tools they need to prevent the body from breaking. And if we could do that, if we could switch from a reactive mindset, which is I'm going to wait till the body breaks and then we're going to, if we're holistic, we use non-toxic modalities to try and patch them together. If we're conventional, we use what we learned in vet school. If we're integrative, we use a combination of both of those. But I believe that foundationally, Peter, that's the mindset that needs to shift to be able to get us out of a point of pain, not just for ourselves as doctors, but for our patients that are degenerating. When I first went to the very first holistic conference ever in my life, I, the, I went to my first holistic conference in the U.S. in 1996. And I was a little taken aback even then that when I attended lectures and, and seminars, beautiful people teaching us how to address kidney disease and liver disease and cancer with non-toxic modalities. I was thankful for that. 
what I was shocked by was that no one was talking about how to prevent those diseases from occurring. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That's, uh, that's so true. And I, I also think that another a real bummer, I'm going to call it, is uh, that we have been taught that if we don't follow certain protocol, if we don't follow certain um, treatment plan, that we fail at the exams. We have to follow certain cookie cutter cookbook protocol. And uh, it kind of makes us more obedient soldiers than than creative healers who kind of can find solutions because not every dog, every cat with kidney disease is the same. And then we have to actually really look at uh, where the animals live, what they're given, how they're fed, uh, what environmental toxins there are and so on. And I know that that's your passion too, the environment. So tell me what, like in the course of your career, what has been the most surprising thing about medical science? What surprised you the most um, that you didn't expect or? I think the thing that is ongoingly awe-inspiring for me is first of all, how resilient the body is. The body is a strong, magnificent, magical carton. And I don't know about you, Peter, but the more I learn, the more in awe I am of the magnificence of the honor that we get to care for these animals, but also all of the ways that the body can heal and restore itself. We don't just have one path. We have all these different paths that we can take to help unlock a healing response in our patients, in our own bodies, that the body has all these fail safe options built in for healing and recovery. The body wants to be well and the body wants to thrive. And if we can get out of the way and facilitate a healing response, it can happen sometimes in a way that we were not expecting, but we have to be open to it. And we have to recognize I think generally speaking as a profession that we didn't learn all that we needed to learn in those eight or 10 years, that as we continue learning, we have more opportunities to be better healers because we are recognizing the vastness of how the body can heal. And it's our job as detectives to match up, to identify what can best unlock a healing potential in our patient. And then to be open-minded to how that healing potential is going to occur. That's an ongoing process. So our goal basically is uh, to remove the obstructions to healing and the body heals itself. Um, we don't do a whole lot, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> we don't do a whole lot. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, you're, you're correct because sometimes I, I often say that, that I'm almost embarrassed how trivial and simple the basic principles of disease prevention and healing and healthcare are, how basic they are. If we don't poison the body, if we remove the toxins, if we give it what it needs. And obviously there are the genes as well, which is the unfortunate card. But even that, I think that, well, they say that the genes are responsible for a certain percentage, right? 15, 20%, and the rest is epigenetics. The rest is the, the environment and the, the emotions and everything else that we deal with. So uh, that's so, so fun. Karen, so what do you think the, the, the most common misperceptions are about veterinarians and veterinary medicine? You've been in practice for some time. I have. I think there are a lot. I think that sadly, a lot of people, and I see this more so now on social media, and it's just so heartbreaking for me. Uh, people think that veterinarians are, are in this profession for the money and they, they, I think that, I think that veterinarians used to be held in higher esteem and with the debt load that many veterinarians take on and with the, with the inability for veterinary insurance to be really a, uh, to, in the same respect that human medical insurance is able to provide some coverage for catastrophic catastrophic events that are 
unbelievably expensive. We don't have those luxuries in veterinary medicine. We don't have a lot of luxuries in veterinary medicine, and yet we make do with what we can using the best tools that we have available to do our utmost best attempt at saving your animal's life. We're all trying to do that. I think some of the biggest hangups and hardships are the fact that veterinarians are at a place where they are financially struggling, they're emotionally struggling, and Peter, I believe that they are ener energetically struggling because I don't think veterinarians have been well equipped to deal with the vast majority of diseases that they're seeing. They're seeing lifestyle-related diseases related to poor diet and environmental impacts that create disease in the body. Everything from, you know, the cells start aging. Uh, when, when I was doing the research for Doug Cancer series, it was, it was impressive to hear some of the top anti-aging doctors relay that a dog that's between one and two years of age is having internal cellular aging at a capacity that we need to be aware of so that we can begin supporting autophagy between one and two years of age. That's something when you, there again, if we had a proactive mindset where once veterinarians can embrace that we can prevent the body from breaking, but we have to switch everything. We have to switch from the ground up, how we're thinking, how we're talking, how we're training, what the expectations are that you're going to bring your pet in when they're well, because it's my job to keep it well. You're not going to bring me a sick pet because we're never going to let your pet get sick. We're going to keep them above the level of disease and prevent degeneration from occurring. When you first really that, that concept to someone, people are like, what? But after you let it sink in and marinate, most people will say that really resonates with me. Is it possible? And once you show them that it's possible, there is no more convincing. I, after 2001 with my own clientele, I've never had to say, Hey, please bring in your healthy animal. No, it's, it's a non-factor. But what I see online, Peter, are the comments the comments from people still in a reactive mindset saying, you just want me to bring you my healthy animal because you want to make money on the exam. And I think, how do we help reactive owners not recognize that they are holistically reactive? And that's a big piece that I see that the vast majority of holistic veterinarians I work with are holistically reactive. So their clients, they don't see their patients until their patients have a symptom and then they're treating them holistically, which I'm very thankful that they're starting with non-toxic options. How do we shift the mindset so that we help our clients understand that out of a disease model is an uphill battle to regain health? Whereas if we can prevent the body from breaking, we are not in this state of reactively trying to play catch up with a broken body. We're preventing degeneration from occurring. If we can make that shift, everyone wins. Veterinarians no longer burn out. Veterinarians have a bigger, broader toolbox. Clients understand the value and the weight of intentionally making wise lifestyle decisions because they don't want to deal with disease in a year or two. Everything shifts, but it involves a paradigm shift in the health and wellness concept. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, uh, I think that uh, people don't realize that um, they can do the most for their animals in the early years, that they can really start uh, looking at uh, the way they exercise, the way they treat injuries, the way they um, make sure that the body has everything that, that, that it needs and so on. And, and despite that, I think that, you know, we fail or we have so much to learn, but, but also the feeling that we are doing all we can and all we know is actually also very helpful as opposed to living in fear and worrying what is going to happen when our dog is going to be seven or 10 or 13 or 16, like losing our animals is horrible, right? And there is nothing, there is nothing that we can do about it, but knowing, losing them and knowing that we've done everything that we don't need to beat ourselves up is actually is 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 helpful it it can be a real remedy for the grief that we have to go through. and and i do think not only do i think you're spot on with that that we we want our we want to get our clients our patients our friend our colleagues to the point of recognizing that our job as guardians and as a member of the healthcare team i really empower my clients i'm like listen you're driving the boat you, you've asked me to partner with you. Thank you that you, that you trust me and that you, that I get to be your teammate. 
But first and foremost, you are the one nourishing your dog or cat. You live with them. You see what they're exposed to. You can see how much tension is on the neck. You can see when they when their back end starts to go. You can you you can see that their muscle mass is starting to shift. You can see the plaque and tartar months and days before I'm going to see your animal. If we can empower guardians to recognize that they are advocates of wellness for everything that they care for, first and foremost, do we want them to come to us for advice? I, I, it's an honor and I'm so thankful that they do, but they are first in line to being knowledgeable advocates for intentionally creating wellness in their animals. They are first. So they, first and foremost, they shouldn't advocate that responsibility to anyone. It's my job is to care for my body and your job is to care for your body and your job is to care for the animals that you committed to. And my job is to care for mine, but we have to know enough to make excellent decisions. If we don't know enough, Peter, then we get stuck in fear. Once we can have the fear, fear is a powerful tool. And the only way to overcome fear is with knowledge. And then when you know that you have enough knowledge to make good decisions, then you can put your head on your pillow at night and say, I lost my dog at 10 from cancer and I had a 10 year old golden retriever who had the DNA for hemangiosarcoma and my golden should have gone to 17 and he died at 10, but he was happy, 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 thriving in his body until he laid down and died. And when you are able to knit together everything you've done, still taking into account that genetics and genetic expression are heartbreaking, but that you've done everything you can, you're at a place of recognizing that we're doing what we can with the knowledge we have from a place of empowerment, not of fear. But it's never going to be a good time to lose our animals. It's never going to feel any better whether they die at 2 or 10 or 20. It's difficult no matter what. If we have the tools we need to make good decisions, then the genetics piece, which will rob our animals early in their lives, oftentimes, we have done what we can. And I believe that that's the best remedy for heartbreak is to be able to say, I don't have any regrets. Yeah, yeah. You know, there is the other side of the spectrum where, where people who learn how to keep their animals healthy and they learn how to feed and learn how to prevent disease, uh, they get into the phase of uh, what I call the missionary zeal, where they try to convince everyone and they will run into obstacles. And it happens to us, right, that we see the disaster about to happen or see see foresee that it will happen in a few years from now and people are close-minded and then i'm sure it happens to you then they come when it hits the fan and it's heartbreaking it almost feels like we're seeing someone about to cross the road in front of a car and we try to pull them back and they shake us off and they get hit. They also get so, angry at you before that, before, before they get hit, they say, don't tell me what to do. I've made up my mind. But Peter, that, I don't know about you, but early on in your career, when you would be standing at the grocery store and when you would see grocery store kibble from the person in front of you go by early on in your career, I don't know if you are like me, but I would be like, excuse me, ma'am, I don't know if you know, but I would feel the need to educate people who didn't want to be educated. That, that was me. And I don't know if you ever have felt the need to educate people that didn't ask that. for it. It that. doesn't go well. <laughs> no, it doesn't go well, but, but as we go, I'm not sure, you know, it would be actually really good, 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 um, good, Segue to segue, segue. My my English uh, sometimes kind of I stumble with the words. Anyway, um, he, you know, it, as time progress progresses, we learn different methods, right? How to approach people, and I actually find that the best way to approach people is to give them compliment about their dog, and you know, what a beautiful dog, and you must love love him or her. I, I think, you know, I just had recently, I had a situation where um, <laughs> we had a family weekend with the family here and there's this beautiful basset hound 
coming to the weekend. And, you know, as soon as she enters the room, she's lovely and sweet and cuddly and she wants to be pet all the time. But the room is filled with this yeasty smell that is beyond anyone's imagination. And I found that, you know, the, the, the best way for me to act and be in those situations is to just live by an example, right? Like feed my dog in front of them. I let them admire my dog's coat uh, if I'm lucky and my dog has, doesn't have any hot spots and rushes, right? Because it, it all, it happens to all of us. But, but I think that living by examples and not really pushing, it just, and, you know, mention, mention maybe one or two words. Say, hey, you know, if you ever need me, just, just let me know, right? And, um, and, then, and then loving them where they're at. And that's a tall order, Peter. Loving people as they're making horrible decisions, in our opinion, in our opinion, loving people where they're at and truly loving them, not being cordial, but truly loving them is the growth on our end. That's our work, is being able to watch people decide, I'm going to leave my dog entirely yeasty because what we don't know, Peter, is where they're going to be in a year or two or three. We do, if we give up on people, write them off, block them off, they don't, you know, if we cut people out of our lives that aren't where we're at or doing what we think they should be doing, we've limited our opportunity to ever be in relationship with them, influence them, or start a bigger, broader conversation. Start a bigger, broader conversation. So hanging in there with people that are wildly different from us, not making the same decisions as we are, I think is a really important thing to do because we don't know what's going to happen down the road. And we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure that we all can find um, areas where we may seem to be less open-minded and less open to different suggestions, right? And uh, I think empathy is, um, is a great virtue and characteristic, but at the same time, and, and I, you know, as I, I could classify myself as an empath. I, I got upset with my father when he, in the old days, spanked my sister. I was two years old. And I apparently got really upset in the high chair of the table when he spanked my sister. But I do think that empathy is also an expression of the discomfort of seeing the suffering and the unnecessary suffering. So, you know, I, I think that I am having a difficult time to see people um, coming back with what could be prevented and then be kind and be understanding and so on actually is the only way to, only, only way to be, even though it's super hard. It's the next level it is, of empathy. It right? is. It yeah. is. And I think that I think that yeah. that's where the work comes in. I, I'm sure like you, I have had to have conversations. So at least my exams go something like this. Uh, hour long exams, here's your to do list. I'll see you in three months. If if you, the patient cannot get worse, if you get worse, call, but otherwise known it is good news. And you here's your to do list. Here's phase one, phase two, phase three of what we're going to do, how we're going to implement it. If they come back at the three, six, nine month mark and nothing has changed, they didn't do anything that I suggested, they haven't implemented anything, the dog's about the same. As a proactive wellness human, my innate reaction is, is we just lost nine months of time and your animal's probably going to get worse. And wh why haven't you implemented these things? And it's your animal that's suffering. And I feel horrible. And like, what has prevented you from actually instituting my suggestions? But that's not a functional approach and no one feels good when that approach is taken. So the evolution that I have been inspired to take is I'm going to, I will see you and I will love you and your animal for the rest of forever. If you decide to do absolutely nothing, because I want to be here for you. If your animal gets better or if your animal gets worse, I'm not going to abandon you. And I wish the best for your animal. And I desperately want to encourage you or motivate you to inspire you to make these changes. But if I can't, I'm not going to abandon you and I will be here for you. That those are big girl words coming out of my mouth because that's not my nature is why on earth would you not be doing this? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, I think it's so beautiful to actually hear it from from me because um, it happens in veterinary medicine, right? The clients who don't follow the instructions, many colleagues get really upset and or if someone disagrees, I always tell my clients and, and people in my life and dog lovers that they are there to make their decisions and nobody should be bossing them around. Nobody should be telling them what to do. And if they have, uh, you know, some sort of dysfunctional reasons for not following, then if we are at our best and if we really walk the talk, then we should support them. We should actually be there for them and say, so listen, like I understand, I have also areas in my life where I procrastinate or I don't do what I should do and so on. Like, what can we do here, right? So it's, it's really beautiful. Um, it brings me to another thing. Like we could talk for three hours, I'm quite certain, but, um, I'm really curious, like everyone has an aha moment in life. Like what was your greatest aha moment? My greatest aha moment was when I was, um, I had heard about a woman named Barbara Harvey who had the top success in the U.S. as a wildlife rehabilitator. All she rehabilitated was hawks, eagles, owls, and falcons, raptors. And she had like a 90% success rate with raptors. And the U.S. average is about 38%. If you get an injured animal in, you have about a 30 to 40% chance of curing them and releasing them back to the wild. This woman has like this stellar, obnoxious, almost unbelievable success rate. You're like, what is she doing? So I called Barbara Harvey and I said, Barbara, my name is Karen Becker. I'm 16 years old. I'm from Iowa. I'm also a wildlife rehabilitator. You have a really good success rate. I really want your success rate. I'd like to know how you do it. And she said to me, you're poisoning your animals. You recognize these animals are thriving before they're injured. And all we are, all we have to do is get out of the way. Our job is to not put poisons into them. Our job is to nourish them as they're healing so that they can have a functional healing response. And then she hung up. Well, at 16, I didn't realize people just hang up on you. I thought we got disconnected. So I called her back, you know, now at 50 plus, I'm like, okay, well, you know, we're at different points in our evolutionary curve and she's angry at me, but maybe in five or 10 years she won't be. And I'm just going to let, let it lie at 16. You call them back. And I'm like, Barbara, I think we got disconnected. And she said, no, I hung up on you. And I said, well, why would, why would you do that? And I think she realized then that my intentions really were pure. I really wanted an amazing success rate and I didn't have it. I had the typical 35% success. I invited myself to Barbara Harvey's house, which was a teepee in Horicon, Wisconsin. Uh, in the summertime, she slept in a teepee outside. In the winter, she had a beautiful home in 13 acres where she rehabilitated animals. And all she used was homeopathy. And I didn't even know how to say the word homeopathy. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about it. I think my biggest aha moment was when Barbara Harvey showed me pictures of the raptors that she had re rehabilitated. And she had done it all with this these little white balls that had no medicine in them, ultimately speaking. This is, of course, long before I went to veterinary school, but her success rate and watching her treat these animals and watching how these animals responded to one form of vibrational energetic medicine was life altering for me. And what that taught me at a very young age was that I didn't understand how or why the body was healing and responding. But when I say I didn't care, I care that the body's healing and responding, but I don't have to know why, Peter. I think my biggest aha moment is as a doctor, I will use whatever it takes to help my patients heal. And I may not be able to explain it to you or understand all the intricacies of why, but I also don't have to. I'm okay with the body coming into homeostatic balance through prayer, through flower essences, through whatever it takes that I may not be able to explain, but I don't have to. If that animal is responding and healing, I don't have to say anything. I, I just need to get out of the way. I learned that at a young age, and certainly I think we have been criticized, but anyone in integrative medicine has been criticized for not having double-blind placebo-controlled tests and results and papers 
everyone's comment is, I'm not going to do it until you can show me a study. Much of the miracles that I have witnessed myself, there's not going to be a study. And I'm okay with that. And you learned that when you were 16. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's amazing because it does take guts. It does take um, an insight for a 16 year old. Um, it's it's quite amazing. So, you know, it must be the genes as well that well, you were basically predetermined, maybe previous yeah, lives. I, I mean, who, who knows? knows, who knows? Right? I will also say this. I grew up in Iowa and any you don't probably don't know much about Iowa. It's an agricultural state. You know, there's nothing there. No sports teams, no mountains to climb. There's corn. And there's good people. That's all that's in Iowa. But there's a whole lot of common sense. And what I also believe is my parents, both teachers saying, you don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know everything. You have to know good questions to ask. And you need to be very observant because it's out of observation that you may not be able to explain anything, but you will know in your heart by observing whether you're going down the right path or whether you need to switch gears. I believe that common sense and observation are two really important pieces to being good doctors. Nice, beautiful. It's, um, it's very courageous what you're doing and I've always admired you for that. And I think that's why people love you so much because you have, uh, you have really not wasted any time to say how you feel and what you do and why you do it. How do you overcome the fact that you obviously have been ostracized or you have been, you have been called names and you have been told that you're the enemy of science and veterinary medicine and all that? Like, how do you deal with that? How do you? How do you cook? How do you look after your mental health as well yeah. and all that? Well, um, character is who I know I am on the inside. And I know who I am on the inside. And I know why I was put on this earth. And I know my mission. And my mission is not to um, impress my colleagues or to be popular or yeah yeah or exactly i might i i have really good boundaries with focusing on my mission you know i want to improve the well-being of animals lives and i want to protect the earth and i will go about that in the least toxic ways possible even if i can't give you a double blind placebo controlled study that's a very vulnerable attackable space that's a bold statement to say, I will do whatever it takes as long, above all, do no harm. And I live by that. Above all, I'm not going to do anything to put an animal's life at risk, but I will offer you options that I have seen work before that I cannot medically explain how or why healing occurs, but I have seen it. Are you interested in trying it? And that's totally attackable in our profession. But for the patient and the client who are desperate, desperate. They've come to you because you are the last stop. I don't really care what other people think of me. The conversations between me and my client and that patient, and if my client, which has never happened, I've never had clients say, well, that seems really wonky. My clients say, I am so thankful that you have given me options I've never heard about before. And yes, I want to do them. When you have that conversation on a bigger global scale, that is not how we were taught to do medicine. So of course I have been highly criticized. I have been highly criticized for lots of things, including discussing not just my mistakes, like I've spayed, I spayed all of my dogs in my practice at six months of age or before. I really wanted to talk about my mistakes because I believe out of me sharing my mistakes and what I've learned, I can help younger veterinarians not make the same mistakes. If I can prevent pain in my profession and pain in my patients, I will take every opportunity to do so. When you admit all the ways that you have failed as a veterinarian, it also opens you up for, for attack. So some of it has been self-imposed in that I'm interested in starting a conversation about how we potentially can make our profession better by what we've learned. And what we've learned means we've made some mistakes. Let's, let's talk about that. But I also believe 
that by discussing the the non-discussable topics, we make we humanize medicine and we bring the art back in to the science of medicine. And by talking about that, which is a big taboo topic, we're not supposed to talk about that aspect. As scientists, as doctors, that's those are topics we are not to discuss. But I want to discuss them because um, separating the soul from science, I believe, makes us less effective practitioners. So... It makes us yeah. half as good, basically. I, that, that, that's and my you know, viewpoint, yeah. 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 Um, I sometimes find it very frustrating because, um, you know, there, there, there are many aspects of holistic healing or medicine that we use that are self-evident, that we don't really need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and years of uh, time to actually prove something that we see in practice working. And that's why the experience is actually very important. But as, as you said, the science is always kind of has dominated the, the medical field and has been put on a pedestal while we all know that butter was good and then it wasn't good and then it was margarine that was good and then it wasn't good again. And, and you know, it changes and we learn. And I, I love the, you know, I think that we all, Someone asked me yesterday, do you know James Herriot's books? I said, yeah, the, 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 the fairy tale book for veterinarians and about veterinarians. But, but I don't think that I was correct because I think that he actually used common sense. He understood how important it is to observe and how important it was to connect with the people who looked after the animals and all that. So, oh my goodness, there's so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> I feel like we need to sit down together again, but um, is there, are there any ways, and I know that most of, most people and most animal lovers here are watching because they want to learn how to extend lives of their animal friends and, and how to make sure that they do everything that they can. At the end, we end up with a heartbreak, no matter how good of a job we do. Do you have any recommendations to people, any suggestions how to deal with the losses in the most, you know, I can't see pain-free because it's always hurting, um, but the most, the best way to deal with the losses, the, 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 the best way, the, the best way to recover from mm -hmm. the losses and, and, and so on. Do you have any ways? Any suggestions? My best, and first of all, you are spot on. Nothing is going to remove the pain. And the pain comes from, if you are like me, I'm a carton junkie. I very much like the fuzzy body. I'm just, people say, well, you know, the, the animals, you know, you know that the animals, it's not, my parents used to say it's natural. You know, everything dies just like everything is birth. Everything dies and death is very natural. Death is totally natural. I just don't like it. I understand it's natural. I understand it's coming. I am a carton junkie. I love the physical fuzzy body. I love the way my dogs smell. I love the way that their fur feels. I love the connection I have. I love the carton. The carton, the physical body holds the energy, holds your animal spirit, your essence, the soul. I believe, and nothing is going to take away the pain of the carton dying. Because if you're like me, of course, we love the tangible, fuzzy, feely. We, that's the piece that's magic. The pain of losing the physical body is immense. The best way for me to deal with loss and pain is to not have regrets. The pain alone is overwhelming. It's the piece of what I could have done, what I didn't do, what I should have done. If I can help my clients, my friends, my family, myself, not have the guilt of that question, Peter, I believe that that's the best gift. The pain is immense. Get a good grief counselor really begin to do a lot of self-care work on what you need to do to get your place to a, a point of being able to function 
in grief, yes. But the regret piece, the shoulda, coulda, woulda, is this ongoing opening of a wound that may have been able to heal if, if that piece was removed. So for me, my, my best advice, knowing that you're going to have pain, the, the loss piece, the best thing we can do is to be able to say, yes, I'm hurting. My heart is in a thousand pieces on the floor and I don't have any regrets. But to get to that point, this is a learning process and a partnership with a, a, a variety of health and wellness people who will play into your animal's life or your own health care enough that you feel very sound with every decision you're making so that you are not dealing with an ongoing, potentially lifelong pain of looking back about what I didn't know or shoulda, coulda, woulda done. So education and empowerment and support of getting to a place where you come out of fear and into clarity and you come out of confusion and into knowing, relaxing into, I am at a point where I'm doing the best I can with the knowledge I have, and I'm going to let myself off the hook. That is a, that's the best place you can be to deal with the loss of a, of a physical body. It's a process. <laughs> That's really beautiful. And I have no idea why, as I'm listening to you, the image of a person who is either drowning or swimming is actually really beautiful because um, it kind of reminds me how easy it is to drown if we don't know how to swim, but also how easy it is to swim when we know how to swim. And we kind of know that our dogs don't leave us, um, which brings me to another kind of, in, on some level, they don't leave us, they never leave us, which brings me to your book that you've written, The Forever Dog, that you've written with Rodney Habib. Uh, what prompted you to write it? And what, you know, why should people buy it? Tell me. And where can they find it? And where can they find you? Uh, so Forever Dog came out of my fascination with the human longevity field and Rodney's fascination with the oldest dogs in the world. And you know, Peter, it's interesting. When you ask men, like, do you want to live to be 150? Men are like, I just want to live as long as I can. You ask women, women are like, no, like, I don't want to live to be 100. I, I, listen, I'd rather die at 60, having full vigor and full capacity, like happy, 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 happy dead, than fall apart piece by piece and get dementia or God forbid cancer or whatever. Like, I don't necessarily want to live to be 150. I really, like, that's not on my list of things to do. But men, including Rodney, want to know what he could potentially do to get a Methuselah dog and they're out there. So it started with Rodney's obsession with, listen, there are 30 year old dogs around the world and there are 29 and 28 year old dogs around the world. Do you think it's just genetics? And of course that was everyone's burning question is maybe they just had good genes, but maybe they didn't. Maybe there was some intentional decisions and choices being made that would be worth a conversation. So it started by Rodney contacting the owners of the oldest dogs around the world. And then it's, and then it led to, we were put in contact with the scientists that did the cheek swabs, looking at their DNA to see, was their DNA? I mean, maybe they're just outliers, but then that led us to the doctors looking at the DNA, but also those lifestyle choices, the scientists, geneticists, nutritionists, longevity experts, both in the human field and in the animal realm, reverse engineering the oldest dogs in the world. Now that is very exciting for me because as a proactive wellness doctor, I am all about recognizing that, listen, we all have DNA in us that's maybe not so fantastic, dogs and cats included. But just because we have DNA that isn't stellar doesn't mean it's a death sentence. And it also doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do. We are not victims of our DNA and our dogs are not victims of their DNA. So what do we do? This is stuff I didn't learn in vet school. This is stuff no one's doing CE about. Like, where's the conversations in veterinary medicine about this? There wasn't any. That is why we wrote the book. When I found out two and a half years ago that there weren't these conversations being had in terms of intentionally doing things to up and down regulate AMPK and mTOR and all the conversations that I think should be happening in veterinary medicine that aren't, my statement was, is I will go to these top 
researchers get the information that they're working on in dogs' bodies and take it directly to the dog lover. Because if I wait until it trickles down through first human tier medical journals, then veterinary medical journals, and then finally down to practical tips that we can institute in dogs' lives, it'll be another 20 years. And I'm the world's most impatient veterinarian. That's why we wrote the Forever Dog. <laughs> so if there was one thing that you'd like to take, uh, you'd like people to take away from the book, what, what would it be? Then? It would be that there's a shit ton more things that we could all be doing that you don't think about that these amazing researchers and longevity experts gave us the science behind in dogs' bodies. I left this writing experience so empowered by so many things that can be done to minimize risk and maximize healthy, thriving bodies. So much more. And to be honest, Peter, I tend to be a little narrow-minded when it comes to food. I, I, my focus is nourishment. And food really matters, Peter. Food is foundational, as you know. But what I find is that a lot of people in our wellness community tend to hyper-focus on nutrition, which I, I love, but out of that, they're missing big areas that need to be addressed in their dog's lives that are playing into early degeneration and a shortened lifespan because their veterinarians are very food focused and not necessarily including all of the other important aspects of creating a safe, healthy, happy home in an environment that allows uh, a nice suppression of expressed DNA and the ability to intentionally use a healthy, clean home to enhance lifespan. Wise lifestyle choices have to happen in every realm of a dog's life because their well-being rests in the palm of our hands. So there's a lot of pressure, but it comes down to knowing. And I wrote this book so people know more so they can make better decisions. Amazing. I think it's time to wrap it up because he said it so beautifully. There's nothing more to be said, even though we could go forever. Where can people find you if they, if they either want the information that you provide or the advice or how can they get so in touch? So the Forever Dog is easy. It's foreverdog.com. And that will give you more information about the book. And my website is drkarenbecker.com. Thank, Thank you so much. Karen. Thank you for inviting me on so your podcast. Fun. So much fun.